Right, so ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce our, our fifth and final session, proper handsome food. Um, what's the food been like that you've had today, pasties and, and cakes? Any good? Good, excellent. And, um, and just whilst we wait for our panelists to join me, um, we're looking for the, the, the sheep farmers of Cornwall. Could you stand up if you like, like sheep or if you farm sheep? We, we fight you. <laughs> Cool. Well, um, yeah, you, you will be in, you're a rare commodity and can well be in high demand in the years going forward. So um, thank you for joining us. Right, if I have palace, palace and chairs to the stage. Right. Cool, yeah, take, take your seats. So in, in, in this session, we know, we know West Cornwall, we know Cornwall itself has some unique attributes, both in terms of landscape, scenery and people. Um, but what qualities do those attributes pass on to the food? What do our customers want? What do they expect? What are they asking for? So to help us answer those questions and more, we've got a great panel here today. We've got um, Beck Tonks from St. New Eggs. Um, also a Farmers Weekly Award winner, Poultry Farmers of the Year 2022. Round of applause, please. <laughs> to her um, left, we've got Paul Rodder. Uh, we also have Rachel Knowles and, um, and James Kitto um, of Butchery Fame. So, yeah, without further ado, I'll hand over to our chair, um, to Bex. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm terrified, so apologies in advance. Um, yes, so just to introduce today, oh, as, as uh, James, James has already, we're, we're kind of, uh, our remit for today was, um, you know, how, how to make... Um, how can we make the best of, of food from, from West Cornwall? You know, what, what, what can we kind of uh, in, uh, influence and, and uh, improve, I guess, it, it's, it's, um, its retail value? Um, I, and I, thinking about that, that, that uh, question, I was thinking, well, actually, maybe we should take a step back and, and have a look at, at uh, more of the... You know who who are who are our customers and who what do the consumers want, and and I, and I think it's quite Im, important for for anybody selling to 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 direct to the consumer uh, or or to a supplier um, to be able to have a little bit more understanding about that and and how have a how, yeah so basically to improve our 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 supply chain. Um, and rather than, than um, producing food, perhaps as we always have, and um, actually being more tune, in, to, in tune with, with what consumers are, are wanting, and, and therefore be on the front foot of a new trend, and then enable us to innovate. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we, we've all run... Rachel, I was going to start with you, if you, if, <laughs> <laughs> if, if you could... Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't, know. I don't know what to do. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Rachel Knowles. Uh, originally, well, farmer's daughter from Liscard. Um, went to Seal Hain um, 30 years ago and met Chris there. Um, qualified as a, a charter surveyor and worked for the National Trust for 10 years as um, a, land, mm. a land agent and project coordinator at the Good Old Finn Estate. Um, but in 2005, I took the opportunity of voluntary redundancy um, and came home to the family farm. Felt a bit more confident as a daughter-in-law. Um, and we also had three daughters, which are more than a job in themselves. Chris used to compare one daughter to 100 cows. <laughs> <laughs> and, now, and then we had 300 cows and we have three daughters. So thankfully, our cow numbers are reducing, if anything, and we're not going to 400 cows. Um, I <laughs> okay, you heard of it. Um, I, never, I never knew what to call myself when I came home on the farm. It was like, my secretary, what am I? I sort of probably lost my way a bit. Um, but luckily, you know, Chris and I have built confidence in each other, so I wasn't too lost. But um, my youngest daughter at Nancledra Primary School came home one day and told me that she'd had to write a fam or draw a family tree. Um, quite interesting because she said it was easy for her because everyone was a farmer. Um, she says, apart from you, uh, right? <laughs> she says, um, she said, what, what, what? Now, what do you, what are you called or something? So I said, um, 
don't know, I suppose you call me a secretary, really. And uh, she goes, oh, I didn't call you that. So I said, what did you call me? And she says, I called you an office farmer. <laughs> and, and actually, I've used that on quite a few forms. God knows what people think when I put it on there. But it is absolutely true. What I do in the office, uh, what Chris does on the farm, I had to do in the office. And it's becoming apparent that it's actually turning full circle now. And, and whatever email might come in or regulations... Chris has to then do out on the farm. So, you know, that role in the office is so important. Um, but then um, in 2015, um, I seem to remember, that was obviously, um, sorry, yeah, 2015, um, people started to ask, I think the milk price was probably quite low then, local communities, how can they support and how can they buy our milk, which was, you know, what I used to say was impossible. Um, so I set off on a little journey to see if we could um, pasteurise and sell our milk direct to the public. Um, in 2016, um, Chris took a group, or we took a group to the Isles of Scilly on a study trip. And, of course, we had to visit the only dairy farm on the Scillies. We didn't know Tim and Sue Hicks at the time, but we've uh, become very good friends with them since that um, trip. And bearing in mind it was 2016, I think we can all remember that far away, they had six dairy cows. They were making a living, and basically Tim said it's about supply and demand. And I'd done a business studies BTEC um, at Saltash College, and I had obviously learnt that lesson, but it's not until it, it's shown in reality that it is so obvious. So for three months in 2016, I did some what I call market research. I was selling pasteurised milk from a pop-up honesty fridge at the house. Um, and I spent a week um, driving a 1,000 miles around the country, visiting other farms doing a similar thing, which there weren't so many then. Um, but I learned a hu you know, so many lessons, um, critically, that milk is very heavy, and it's very difficult to clean up after. So if I was going to take this project further, I'd have to pasteurise very close to the bulk tank. Um, I think it was such hard work pasteurising 15 litres at a time that... I was starting to wear a bit thin on it, really, I think. Um, but then we had a call from David Rodder and said, I hear you're selling milk. Have you considered grant funding? And I remember the call very well because Chris was sat opposite me at his desk and I just like, no. We tried funding before and been pretty unsuccessful in a lot of it and a lot of paperwork. So anyway, we had a meeting and the rest is history. Um, we were lucky enough to get 50% um, on a lot of our eligible... I say a lot of it, it wasn't all of it because I forgot to put a lot in it as the project goes on. Um, so, yeah, which enabled uh, me to put a new bay on our um, dairy building, um, buy an inline pasteuriser, vending machines, um, and start pasteurising pasteurizing milk. Um, and, as I said, close to the bulk tank. The other things that I took advantage of was Chris's iced water system his hot water system, lots of things, but um, they do now share my compressor. So, <laughs> so it's fair. Um, we pasteurise milk straight after milking, or this year we actually trial pasteurising milk at the same time as milking, which actually worked quite well. So you can't get much fresher than that. And because of our inline pasteuriser um, and piggyback piggybacking on our iced water, um, we now have milk that, um, on the shelf life test, lasts over two weeks. Um, touch wood, we've never had any complaints about it. Three, but it turns out that it was um, the customers' fridges were all set at like 10, 11 degrees. Milk should be kept at um, five degrees or under. Um, we definitely don't homogenise our milk and we don't uh, standardise our milk. Um, basically, the simpler you keep it, the you can retain the quality in, in your milk. So the less I do to our milk, um, the better it is. Um, I'm lost on my cards here. Yeah, um, we're very lucky. We've been given permission from Arla to process um, a, p a percentage of our milk, um, which means that I don't have any balancing. We just do whole pasteurised milk. Um, when I did our three months trial at home, we did semi-skimmed and I did clotted cream and it was honestly the best cream, you know, you could find, but it was just too stressful for me with everything else that was going on. So I stick to milk, 
Very glad we have, um, because basically what I take out of the bulk tank is sold. We pasteurize three mornings a week, four now in the summer. Um, and what I leave, the tanker picks up. Um, so yeah, so it's a, a great system. Um, on my traveling, I learned a lot about different things. And actually, one of the farms I visited was Kevin and Katie's before they were there. I forgot to mention that earlier. Um, and that guy, that farmer, I forgot what he's called now. Anyway, Kurt Ride, that's right. Um, basically, he was trying to do everything. Um, and I came home and I think I nearly cried because it was just like I knew it wasn't going very well. Um, so basically, he had a YTS, as he described it, milking his cows. He was getting up at midnight to deliver the milk that his wife had pasteurized. I think they had three kids, I can't remember, but it was just. Just, I just felt so sorry for them. So the one thing I learned was I was not going to do doorstep delivery. I'm not very good at getting up in the morning. Um, I might have been a dairy farm's daughter and wife, but I don't like setting my alarm much before 7 o'clock in the morning. And I'm quite happy to admit it as well. So we weren't going to deliver milk because um, we, Chris and I quite, quite firmly believe that if we can't do it ourselves, we shouldn't really ask somebody else to do it, um, especially if they're off sick or what have you. Um, so basically since 2017, when I started um, selling from up at the dairy as opposed to the house, we were doing about 400 litres a week. Um, and now this um, last year, our average was nearly 4,000 litres a week. Um, so, you know, really, really proud of what we've achieved and maintaining a, hopefully a good image um, and a great quality milk. Um, we couldn't survive without social media, um, advertising, etc. is too much. So thank you to anyone who's spread the good word about us. Um, we've got aware to, we've had to have a website. I remember having a discussion with Chris at the time. He said, oh, we, he agreed we needed a logo, but he thought I could do it because I could do Word on the computer. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we. Um, we had the, the grant funding helped us with our website, helped us with the logo, and we've tweaked it since. You might not notice it, but um, you know it's it's been a, an interesting journey. Um, what are we talking about? Yeah, so we're very proud of what we achieved and the reputation. Um, we it still feels strange for a small family farm up in the hills of Trink where people used to take the mickey out of us for grazing our cows as much as we did and, oh, you know, Chris up in the hills is doing this, that and the other. But, um, you know, people have heard of Trink now, whereas I don't think they'd heard of Trink. And, um, you know, a few customers, what they say make, makes it all worthwhile, all the hard work. You know, someone the other day said, you have got the best milk in the world. And, and it's just lovely to hear all those comments, whereas previous to selling direct, we, um, yeah, basically, it's not, it's not up to the tanker driver to help to say thank you for our, the milk he's collecting, but we just, just that complete disconnect with, with people. Um, so, um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, Paul, would, from Curthenwood Farm, would you like to tell it your story? All right. Thank you very much, Bex. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think I ought to first learn how to, um, I ought to read my emails. I didn't really understand. I'd speak up here for 10 minutes. Um, I haven't done this much speaking since my wedding vows. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I'll give it a go. But no, um, my name's Paul. Um, I farm in conjunction with my brother and my sister. We farm roughly around 480 to 500 acres. Um, that's broken down into 150 odd acres of winter cauliflowers, harvested from mid-October to end of March. Um, 300 acres of um, winter cereals and spring cereals, um, in which we um, have got a thousand ton store back at the home farm, and uh, where we store it and get rid of it through December, January and February. We do that, try to add a bit of value because um, uh, it's usually a better price. It doesn't always work, but that's the system we've got at the moment. <coughs> so um, that's that. We also got a strawberry business. Um, we started out um, 
supplying the multiples, but very quickly um, went away from that, could, could make a margin. And I think this is something we ought to um, discuss <coughs> maybe in the questions that is about margin. Um, we all hear fantastic speakers all afternoon and morning. And, um, and we do a very good job. Um, sometimes we don't um, acknowledge that um, or be told that. And margin is key on everything we do. Um, it's certainly been installed in myself through my parents that um, hard work will pay off, boy. And, um, you know, and, and normally it does. Um, so the strawberry, so I will come back on these subjects in a minute. And so that leaves about 40 acres where we did, um, in conjunction with SEF, um, uh, a um, Bella Verde crop, um, which we planted an acre a week from beginning of March right through. And, um, but we have not renewed that contract for various reasons. And um, for the first time, we have rented out ground, which we hardly ever do. Um, so Riviera Produce have had 35, 40 acres for courgettes last year. Um, so that brought in a bit extra income, but like I say, we don't like to do it, um, um, but it just worked last year. I don't think we'll carry on with that, and we'll bring it back into the farming system. <coughs> so, in a bit more detail, um, our cauliflowers are our main business. Um, we've been with SEF Gravel Richards for ever since he started um, the business. He came out to the field one day. Um, You'd never believe it. He, he, uh, his father opened the door to the rig and said, my son would like to um, buy some cabbage off you. And I was looking around and said, well, where, where is he? And this shy boy sort of came out behind. You'd never believe it now. And um, <laughs> like this, and, and said, yeah, I would like to buy some cabbage. So I um, said, right. And the father did all the talking. Gravel did no talking. And, uh, and said... <coughs> Um, yep, he wants um, a couple hundred boxes off you this week, if possible. We said, we'll do that. He said, you'll have the money by Friday. And he's true to his word. And we had the money on Friday. And that was the start of it. He started from his bedroom, and we've been there ever since. So, the, like I said, Winter Call of Her is our main business. And through all, <coughs> with marketing of it, I have no control on price. So I'm wholly reliant on Gravel to do my negotiations for me and trust in him that he will return us a margin. And <clears throat> through all of this, you have got to know your costings. I think it is, it is so, so important. And since my sister has come back in the business, boy, do we know our costings. <laughs> and, um, and that is fair to say. But... You have got to, because if you don't know them, how do you know you're making a margin? How do you know? And for decision-making, future planning, it is key. And I cannot get that across enough. For our business, it's worked. We've, um, uh, and we make the decisions on purely that. Know your costings. Can we afford to do that? Yes, we can. And we go on. Um, so, on the winter cauliflowers, I have no input on, I don't meet the end customer. We're Tesco's, by the way. We've been supplying Tesco's since we started over 40, 45 years ago, <coughs> and been Tesco ever since. Um, I've only met them once, or twice perhaps, in that time. And um, one um, meeting was not very fruitful. Um, I thought they a load of ignorant so-and-sos, and, -sos. and um, it didn't care about me at all, and we're, what my story was, they were just interested um, getting food on the shelves. <clears throat> I think um, certainly with the winter cauliflowers, the Cornish part of this, our USP is that we can grow veg t um, 52 weeks of the year. That's our unique selling point. Um, and very good quality, uh, very good. So that's our USP. So, um, oh, what was I saying? Yeah, so um, I'm wholly, wholly reliant on Gravel, like I said, for, for him to do our job for, for me, and, um, and then I make the decision. So the control thing on that, the only control I got on that is do I grow or do I not grow for them? And that's the decision we make. 
um, on, on the winter cauliflowers. On the corn, um, like I said, we grow 300 acres, we store it, um, we do all the work ourselves, um, we combine it, we don't combine it unless it's under 16%. That's not always easy. And the system we have got, um, it will take corn up to 17% and bring it down. So 17%, I suppose, is our cutoff. If the combine won't go out of the shed, if it's over. <coughs> and that brings its own difficulties. Um, um, this year, we, we used a contractor, Matthew at the back, and helped us, and, and, uh, and through a contractor and doing it ourselves, we can get the grain in. And then, like I said, our system will keep it nice and aired and fresh. And we will add value to that and ship it out from now on. And that has worked very, very well over the years. Um, we market ourselves, my brother does that, um, through various merchants, and um, so we have got a bit of control there. Um, we're not tied up to anyone in particular. Um, so um, brings its own challenges. Um, the strawberry crop is an interesting one. Um, we grow 8,000 plants. Um, one, we plant them in July, <coughs> and they'll harvest 40 days later. Um, a very small crop then, a six-week picking season, and then they'll overwinter, and then we will pick the biggest crop of it from April to June. Um, like I said, we used to be um, supermarkets, and the people we were with then um, were up in Evesham, and we did have a bit of rapport with the with the N people. Um, we started with Asda and went through the lot of them, ended up with Liddles. And I can remember the meeting. Um, the last time we were with them, the buyer came in and did his spiel and said, just to let you know, um, the price next year will be less than this year. And uh, so father was there at the time. And I remember getting up and walking out. And um, we haven't been back since to the supermarkets on the strawberries. Um, we have taken control of it. I think of all this with the end gate, it was about control. If you haven't got control, um, then you've certainly got to know your pricing. You've got to know your cost. Um, so with the strawberries, um, we, we supply a lot of farm shops around the local area, and it's worked very, very well. Um, we've got a good rapport with them. they with us. They like our product, we like them. Um, our surplus will go to a wholesale in Cornwall, Continental Fruit, and they are brilliant, and um, can't speak more highly of them. Um, a very good working relationship. Um, so yeah, so I think that's us in a nutshell. Um, thoughts for the future? Um, I see no change on our farm at the moment. We have diversified in the past in other crops, um, I think the future is quite bright. Um, people need to eat. Um, we're good at what we do, and we've got to push that point. Um, certainly a lot, lot more. Um, Cornwall is a good place. We can produce the best food in the country. And um, we just got to recognize that and be confident and, um, and get it out there. Um, I did want to say something about the corn... <coughs> With the strawberries, we do push the fact that they are Cornish, and I think people coming down, because most of our customers are holiday makers who pick them up in the farm shops, who want localism, and it's brilliant, there's a place for it, but with our cauliflowers, I feel that we have been, we've tried it in the past, and it's not sort of worked. Um, I think trying to convince someone in the depths of Birmingham to pick up a Cornish collie is quite hard. And, um, and uh, so I think we've got to rely on the quality factor, the, the fact that we can produce it all year round and give a damn good um, end product to whoever you're selling to. In our case, is SEF. We, once we start cutting, we like giving continuity. So we're cutting six days a week from middle of October through middle of March. Um, the odd time with a few frost, you might go a bit short, um, but that's what we do. So gravel is quite good for him because he knows what's coming in. He can plan for that. So we've got no peaks, we've got no troughs. It's a flat line. 
And um, not easy to do at all. Um, but over the years, we sort of refined our sort of program and through new varieties and a bit of planning and, uh, and all that, it, 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 it can be done. Um, we've touched on this morning, looking after your soils. That is key. It's key to our business. We don't rent out. We do it all, except for last year, but we um, all in-house. So we rotate around the farm. So um, our break crop, so our, our is two years collie and then three years corn. Um, and that's the way we do it. So no ground on our, our farm will be growing brassicas more than two years in a row. Um, we, um, we, we look after our soils. We use um, compost, splat ridden. Um, we a running program of that. We'll do 40 odd acres a, a year and go around the farm. And that's been good as we've been doing that. Um, <coughs> is that our time? Sorry, cool. it goes quick, doesn't it? Right, that's me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Next is James Kitto, again, an award winning butcher, and to tell us a story about your prop and some food. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Penzance, for inviting me in. Um, obviously, you've shared a lot, of a lot of knowledge and experience this afternoon, so um, with nearly 50 years to try and get in 10 minutes, it's going to be quite hard for me, but uh, <laughs> I'll make a start anyway. Apologies first to the people that have heard me speak, and I will be pointing you out if you start nodding off, all right? So be on your toes, please. But for the ones that haven't heard me talk, or my story, or, or our family story, really, um, I shall begin. So my name is James Kitto. I'm the fifth generation of our family butchers and I trade as James Kitto Butcher and Grazier. So we're from the farm at Kilhallen, which has been in the family since 1850. Um, it used to be a kill house uh, up until 2001. And then in 2003, we were lucky as well as some other panelists here to get some objective one funding and turn it into a cutting plant, which it is now. So on the farm, we, um, it's not a very big farm. We've got 130 acres. Um, I'm farming um, red rubies predominantly, but the main core business of the farm really is the butchery, it's the cutting plant. So we have a diverse range of customers, ranging from schools, hotels, pubs, restaurants, um, little shops that perhaps hasn't got a butcher's locally to them, so we can pre-pack some meat and get in there in rural, rural areas. Uh, lots of campsites when they're on, the season is, you know, that's been a really good season this year for, for shops like that. Um, and then obviously for people like yourselves, we do butchery, home kill, uh, we don't slaughter anymore, we use whichever is the nearest abattoir to you or to us, which is, is ideal for the food miles, and then we'll prepare your meats ready for you to resell or do whatever you wish to with them. Um, diversification is a big thing, we've done a lot of diversification on the farm. Um, it's, it's one thing, growing crops and rearing animals, but people need to be farmed as well. And I've looked at that as quite, luc not lucrative, but it's, it's helped push my business because it's got the brand name out there. Um, because I invite people onto the farm, it starts off, it started off with young farmers clubs for their club nights to come and have a look around. And one of the first, one of the last questions that you get after you've spent two hours of your time showing the young farmers around your, your plant and what you do and teaching them about meat and why I choose a certain breed of animal and they can see the, the end part of it, after they've given the vote of thanks, what's the first question that they normally say? Where's the nearest pub? Exactly. <laughs> so I'm like, hmm. I'd like to go to the, with those, those guys and, you know, and perhaps share some experience with them, have a drink with them, definitely. And if there's always someone that might be a little bit shy in that group that won't necessarily put their hand up and ask a question in front of everybody else. But if, they're, if you're approachable and they can come to you, then, then you've got them. So that's why I wanted to be part with them as well. So I went and got a premises license. We put a shed up and we had a little bar put in. So I got a captive audience now every time we got a young farmers club. <laughs> so even though we're given a bit of free time, I'm actually getting paid for it at the end of the night. So it's, it's not too bad. It does go around in circles. But that just goes to show, if I can do that with farmers, with people of the same like-minded industry and that, what can we do for people that don't know anything about farming? We can do a lot more. So we, um, we work closely with schools. This all started really with um, the Royal Cornwall Show during the Cornwall Food and Farming Days. I'm very proud to be part of that and take my little meat unit over there and, and explain and show 
try to explain and, and give the children a chance to recognise and guess what meat it is I'm holding up. I remember the very first year we did it, it was around horse gate. And I had a chicken in my hand. And I held the chicken up and I said, can anybody tell me who th what this is? And little Johnny down the front was like, is it horse, mate? Mm. Like this. And I just said to the teacher, oh, you've got a joker of the class. And she said, no. She said, it's on the tips of everybody's tongues at the moment. It's topic. On the news, everywhere they look, it's all about horse gate. She said, so he generally doesn't know. So that sort of like shot me down a little bit, and I tried to like you know think right. We're engineering my questions a little bit better on this, but it just goes to show how little people know. If that's a child that doesn't know, that means his parents don't know, and he, they've never been taught. One of those things that I always say as well is a saying that you, you very rarely hear is being brought up around your mother's apron strings. Mother isn't at home anymore. She's not cooking. It's all ding meals for most of the people that uh, you know, are in busy lives. And it's through no fault of their own, it's just the way society has gone. It's a convenience, fast way of living. And people then, when they get into this trap, it's very hard for them to appreciate good food. So that's just defining what sort of customer base that you can look for. So going back to my customers as well, what we do then, because I've got my red rubies which are grass-based, grass-fed based, and I'm working with Tom and, and other people to try and get my soil health up on my farm to improve the meat quality, and then naturally that will benefit our health, which is, will take the burden away from the NHS. So all these things, there's a massive, great, big whirlwind of, of information and knowledge, but it's just so vital to the general public, and that's what we need to try and do, is get that out to them. So with the beef that I choose, I choose uh, native breeds, Ideally, because of the countryside and the landscape we have definitely here in Cornwall, um, these little small animals are a lot more better suited. They don't poach up the ground so much, um, and they just thrive. You remember when we had the um, beast from the east a few years ago? Well, I had some Dexters and Rubies out in the, in, in the snow when it suddenly came, and I had the round feeder, and I was only feeding them a bit of hay. That was all it was. Whereas the dairy farmer next door had his cows wrapped up with a hot water bottle and, and a blanket, electric blanket, you know, because they're just not suited for that cold weather. And then shortly after that, we had the drought. It was a very dry season. My cows and followers were all out and they were paring the hedges. I didn't have an edge trimming bill that year because they were native breeds and they were picking from the edges, picking the berries, natural foragers. Whereas everybody had, had used their first cut, was on second cut and crying out for, for another cut. So just by using something that's natural to the landscape, native to this country, and, and just suits our, our needs, really, is good. Because what our customers want, especially in the, the catering industry, is small beef. So if you take, you go and get a, an eight ounce sirloin or ribeye, you like to have a little bit of thickness to it so that you can cook it how you like. If you have a big charolais or something probably big, six, 700 kilos live weight, then obviously your eight ounce steak is gonna be very, very small, like paper thin. And the chefs can't cook it. Um, and then the customer won't be happy because they don't like it. Whereas years ago, it's, it's a bit of a thing because years ago when my grandfather and my great uncles were, were killing 12 South Devon bullocks a week, you know, on their meat vans and all that, it was um, a different story because they never had no refrigeration. Everything was four years plus of age, possibly. Um, because they didn't manage farms like we manage farms today. So they, things were bought and turned out field. They had massive great bullocks, you know, hanging up. Um, never hung it, and, and now you have, everything's got to be hung for a maximum of 30, 56, whatever dates you want. But now it's mainly baby beef. So why should we be hanging baby beef for as long when we didn't used to hang mature beef? Because it was maturing on the, on the hoof back then. But that's all to do with the quality and how I believe it really is what we're feeding into the animals. Make sure that your soil health is good and that um, you know, what that animal is eating is then being turned into a, a val valuable protein and a nutrient for us, for our human bodies as well. I knew this would happen. I finished what we thought. Right. So, um, so the South Devons. Yeah, anyway. So that's... Um, so, but then as well, years ago, the sirloins... This is how the trade has, ch has changed as well. People, you know, you would have had people doing carveries. So your sirloins, and you, a bigger sirloin would have been a lot easier for the, for the chef or whoever to do a carvery out of it because you're not looking for an actual uniform steak. So the bigger bu bullocks back then suited my grandfather and, and the way it was. But now for the way I farm, I've got some quieter cattle, um, extensively farmed, and, and just producing some great beef. 
A lot of it has come from, I suppose, to get me where I am now is social media. Like Rachel said, it's been a fantastic thing. It was something that I was never on Facebook, didn't want to have anything to do with social media until there was some funding came and it was um, High Street Digital. And I managed to take some funding that came from Cornwall Council somewhere along the line. And um, I went to a meeting in Bodmin and this lady was saying, if you don't go on social media now, that you will be left behind. So I was like, okay let's do it. So I went home and I signed up for Twitter, which I think was 10 years ago, so that must have been 10 years ago. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, all these things. And because you're in people's faces unknowingly sometimes, it just, it just a little remembrance really. So you're not hard selling all the time, it's just that little soft reminder that you're still there, you've still got a great quality product, which is fantastic. But going back to my branding, so because I'm the fifth generation, there are other kittos in the meat trade as well, which can be a bit confusing. So I, a third cousin of mine decided to rebrand from his initial kitto, TA kittos, to kittos quality meats. And I always used to trade as kittos butchers. So I got a bit fed up with this one day because, as Beck said, we've won a few nice awards for lots for um, the business and a lot more for the actual product. And people would see the kitto on the shop and automatically go to his shop and say, can we have some of your award-winning sausages? And he's like, yeah, no problem, here you go. <laughs> uh, and he'd take the money. So I, I got wind of this, and then the other said, I need to differentiate myself and go away. So I spoke to uh, the people that, at Park Signs, that was my godfather as well, that um, does all our signage and that, and, and they were saying, it's not just a colour scheme. You really need to think about a rebrand or a market of where you're going. And they introduced me to a company down in Falmouth, Sames and Little Johns, that came and spent some time with me on the farm. They spent a whole day. They got to know what I was about, my passion, my love for the farming and the food and the meat that we produce, the animals that we have and the care that we all put into them and, and what it's all about. So then they came away with um, the idea being that on the outside of our factory is a lovely piece of marble with um, lead inscription on it. And it was Kitto and Sons, dairymen, butchers. Now back then, they were dairymen because I think they probably had three or four cows, but they were dairymen. Everybody had three or four cows, milked a bit, scolded a bit of milk and went around selling it door to door. And that's what they did as well as, as, well as being butchers. So the, uh, the branding people looked at that and said, you've got history here already. You just need to copy this. Your forefathers are ahead of the game. You've got a logo, you've got a, a, a font, you've got the color scheme, the white and black. The only thing is now we need a bit of an image. So I sent them some photos of some animals that we had, and then they got a graduate from Falmouth University to draw the bull. So if any of you know Laudamus the bull that you see on my branding, that was drawn from a graduate from Falmouth University off a photo. That on its own has pulled in business just because people like art and appreciate art. And one customer, a very good farm shop up in North Cornwall, they came to us because he done us. Um, he done a, a, of course, he was, um, oh, what do you call it? The people that design, a graphic designer. And he saw the van going down Poles Air Force somewhere one day, and he rang me, and he, he said, I've got to ring you. He said, you need to come and see us. He said, that van, that van and that ball, your artwork, that is just saying so much to me, that you believe in your integrity, you believe in your quality, and you believe in the service, what you're doing. And I never thought of it like that. I just tried to get different from my cousin, which I have. <laughs> but at the same time, it's just shown that you know, we've put that energy and a bit of thought into what we're doing and how we're marketing and how we're going. So now people see that van or that ball traveling on the A30 or wherever it is, and people now know that's a kitto, which is great. They might not know it's James Kitto, but they will soon. As soon as they come, they'll know the difference. But it's about getting to know your customer. It's about keeping your customer close. I've heard that twice today. I've heard it from James over here, and I've also heard it from my father on the way down. And I think that's what saved us as a, as a family, as a business as well. It's because as butchers, um, we've been able, I don't know if you know, but we can, we can talk. And we've been able to talk to our customers like, when they come in the shop. And that's the difference from being a supermarket. So for instance, we've seen the BSE crisis, we've seen the foot and mouth crisis, and we've overcome that as independent traders because we've been behind the counter, we've been a face and someone to talk to. And that is keeping your customer close. And it's all about them knowing and buying into your story. And that's what I like about our business as well, because people like yourselves, and I've got some suppliers here in the room th this afternoon, they've bought into my story, because they know, how, they can see how passionate I am about what I'm doing, and I want them to be part of my, my, my travel, my journey as well. We haven't got a big enough farm to, 
to rear all the animals, all the meat that I sell in a year, I just haven't got it. But you guys have. And so then farmers then are like-minded, the same as us, are in, into the same um, type of cattle and the same care for the environment and for the animals as, and share my passion. That's what works for us. So then when my customers want to know where the beef has come from, if it's not my own, I tell them exactly where it's come from. And I say, if you want to go and visit that farm, that farmer is more than welcome for you to go and have a look. Because I think sometimes as farmers, we need to be a little bit more open. We want to be a bit more open, but we just don't know how to. So it's not all about what I do, it's more about what you do, but I tell everybody what you do at the same time, which is uh, where it's got to us where we are at the moment. Yeah, and that's my time. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's great. James, thank you very much. Um, yes, we're obviously focused around, around uh, food and the quality um, and, and really trying to um, gather what, what it is or how we start to approach that to our, for our consumers. And um, we, we had, you know, talking about your USP um, and, and talk, talking about, you know, how, how you can really kind of hone in on, on making the maximum amount of margin for your, for your produce. Um, so really, I, I guess our... Um, I haven't explained a huge amount about our business, um, but uh, we, we've we've started from from zero and worked up. We used to be dairy farmers, so um, yes, moving into poultry and eggs and and how we marketed that, uh, we essentially are a, a marketing company that sells eggs. So I think um, looking at it from a consumer's perspective and working working back uh, it is absolutely vital uh, to to being um, keeping your head above water. Really. Really. Um, so yes, we have. And, and anybody got any questions for the panel this afternoon? Sure. You <laughs> done, Julian? I don't know. I have. I got any questions? No. There's one at the back. Oh, it's the one at the back. Someone's hiding. Hey, Julian Ellis. Uh, so as a lot of people in the room know, we actually process a little bit of our own milk on farm as well. We also grow a few brassicas. We don't actually deal directly with the customer, but we, uh, we have a specific market that we aim for, which is Chinese seaweed, believe it or not. We do have a few chicken, but it's only my sons. There's only nine of them, so we don't have a problem getting rid of those eggs. <laughs> and we do direct sell a little bit of our Guernsey steer beef. But we've got an issue there is that we had a, we've got a, a butcher near Parr that we deal with now and again, but he sp uh, seems to be rather spasmodic. <laughs> I've been called worse. <laughs> <laughs> and all of the enterprises tick over on our farm and they work very well together as one unit. But I'm very conscious that each part of our business is probably not realizing its full potential. And I very often think that it's probably because I'm a little bit shy of social media. In fact, I'm not a mem we're not on Facebook or Twitter or anything. And I've heard here this afternoon that um, a couple of our uh, panelists consider that quite an important part of their business. So I probably should be kick-started into doing something about it. What would be the panelists best advice for somebody who has never had anything to do with any Twitter, Facebook, or anything like that, what would you do or don't do? Do you want to do this, or shall I? Ask the kids. <laughs> yeah, get, get the kids, get the kids, if you've never been on it, get the kids to get you set up. But I would also say that just tell your own story. It's about what you do. People buy our milk, I'm fairly sure, for what we do. We welcome everybody to the farm. I think there's more of our coffee shops. The baristas have visited our farm. There's not many um, other coffee shops that buy commercially available milk. How would they know where their milk comes from? Um, so I would tell your own story. We've had all sorts of companies come and say, we can do your social media but I'm fairly sure that by the time Chris and I've sat down with them and told them what we do, we, we've drafted it ourselves. I'm not saying it's the right thing to do, but 
I think you come across as you then, as opposed to somebody else. Yeah, I mean, I was doing my social media up until the pandemic start, and then it just got so busy. I was just like, I can't, I can't do this because it was a natural organic growth coming in. The people had found the, the website they were ordering, and it, you know that changed my world upside down. So I've it farmed my social media out and you, to um, Muddy Boots, Steve Mitchell. He went on his own, and um, he looks after mine now. And I just, feel, it's quite, you know, he's so helpful, and um, he, he'll, he'll push me. Just say, right, we need to get some new content. What, what, what are you doing today? Take a picture of something. Let's have it. And and, and that's a lot of it is. A lot of some of it is spasmodic, and I will go and take and do stuff for myself. But a lot of the time, it's planned. But if you've got someone that. And, and someone from a farming background that understands us as well, he, he kind of like knows the right way, the right buttons to push, and it, and it is a very big help. And he took all that pressure away from us and just kept us still being there. Otherwise, me, I'm the same as you, Julian. I wouldn't have time to do it. It just I, I know how to do it, but I just wouldn't have the time. Yeah, I think um, about, I oh, must have been about 10 years ago, I was looking at Twitter and thinking, how actually is this... Um, app going to make make turn into money? You know how how am I how, how is it going to connect to to a consumer? I do I couldn't get it. I didn't understand, but we, I went with it. And and also it's also important to remember that many people have uh, we, we take farming perhaps a little bit for granted and what happens on a daily basis but actually many many people have no idea of what goes on so you just putting a picture of what you're doing on a day-to-day -day or going to feed the cows like you see with James's social media it, it, you know it's fabulous and and people really connect with that and they'll want to see it again and again and again and see it, you evolve on and the farming change as, as seasons do so I think it's really a, a really Really important tool, more now, more so now than ever, to 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 be really trying to connect with our consumer because that is the the, the connection. So yes, it is important. Julian, I don't think Twitter is ready for you yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> oh, Jonathan! Jonathan's got a question at the back there. It's a really easy question, Bex. Um, oh. It's been a fantastic lineup of speakers all day. It's Jonathan Jones from Tregothan, by the way. Um, I just would like your views on the panel of, of optimism for this year. How optimistic are you all for business and growing for this year and beyond? Um, yeah, I'll kick that one off. I'm quite optimistic, to be honest. Um, like I said earlier, we grow a quality product, and um, as long as we get our figures right, um, I see it being a very good future. People, like I said, people got to eat, and um, yeah, I, I think it'll be fine as long as we, do, as long as we look after our soils, know our costs, grow the product. We'll be here in the future. Yeah, I suppose actually that brings uh, a good, a good uh, end perhaps to, to summarise um, today, really, because I, I see that. Um, <laughs> There's a focus on food uh, in in the UK since since um, you know with, with energy prices with, with the Ukrainian war and how uh, the, the I, th I think everybody's kind of waking up to the fact that that farming and food is is very precious and we we've got more more work to do on that front but we actually this opens a massive opportunity for us to start telling our story for us to be really really optimistic about what's happening in the future this i mean cornwall especially this is the pantry of the uk you know we should be proud of what we're doing here and and i, I think we're, we're we need to connect with chefs we need to connect with consumers and and we really need to to, to be very bold with what we're doing and, and proud of what we're doing and, and just we're, we're all extraordinary farmers and we need, we need to really put that forward and make sure that, that the world knows about it. Um, yeah, so, yeah. I, I also wanted to <coughs> say, as we're the last kind of session today, is uh, a big thank you to, to James who's put this on. Um, it's been quite a, a feat mm. to organise and uh, absolutely wonderful. So, yeah, James, brilliant. thank you very much.
Okay, thank you, Bex, for that, um, those kind words and for closing. Um, and thank you to the panelists um, for, that, for giving us our final session. Um, yeah, can I ask um, Nick, Trage Nick Tregenza to the, um, to the front, please, who will give us the closing remarks. Uh, whilst Nick's on his way down, can I just, just say thank you? Um, thank you, first of all, to, to you to, to, for turning up. For, you know, it's, it's always the same when you give away a free ticket. You do wonder if uh, people see the sun shining in the morning, whether they'll still, uh, still turn up to the event. So thank you for coming, and thank you for your enthusiasm. Um, it's been brilliant to, see, to hear the hum in the room during the lunch and the coffee breaks as everyone gets to know each other and um, hope shares, continue sharing ideas. Thanks um, to our chairs and to our panellists. Can we have a round of applause for them, please? And, and a special mention um, to Phil Pagelli from the Penrith Landscape Partnership. It's the Penrith Landscape Partnership that have funded this event. Um, and it was a, a joint idea to put it on. And it's um, through their funding that's made it possible. So um, thank you to, for them. Um, also thank to Edward Richardson, who, um, who, well, he's also to thank and to blame, depending on which side of the fence you sit, for um, many, for many of the panellists and chairs to take part in today's conference. So thanks to Edward for, for his thoughts and, and input. Uh, thank you to Moena at St. Burren Farm Shop for the food. I uh, hope you agree that was, that was fantastic. To Queen's Hotel for giving such a lovely and quite historic venue as well. Um, and then you know, notably to the, the partners within the Penwith Landscape Park Project, most notably the uh, National Lottery Heritage Fund. So a round of applause for all those. And I'll hand over to Nick. Okay, thanks. Well, it's been an amazing meeting, and it should be, really, because farming has got to be a man's most amazing invention. It's about 12,000 years old, started at the end of the last ice age, and powered the growth of human population to its incredible size, the development of diverse societies, the Industrial Revolution, which has caused climate change. <laughs> so now we thank the farming industry for feeding the world, and now we're saying, uh, could, could you help with the climate problem? Because <laughs> you've all got to do something on that. And we've heard some really inspiring talks. Now. I thought it might be a rather defensive, downbeat meeting. It's been exactly the opposite. It's been incredibly uh, inspiring. And we've heard remarkable examples of farmers who've reduced their fertilizer inputs, their carbon footprint. They've increased biodiversity and yields all at the same time. So I, I found it really uh, uplifting, actually, and I'm in awe of the complexity of the problems you guys face. You know, every farm is different, and the number of options you decide among is huge. So thank you very much to all the, the pioneers and, uh, and everything that everybody's done so far and will do in the future. Um, James has thanked everybody. Uh, but James himself and Precision Grazing have organized this, so thanks to them. And Phil Pengeli, I think, has something to say at this point. So over to you, Phil. On behalf of the PLP, I really do want to thank James because he's done all the organization of the speakers for us. So we do appreciate it. So I got him something um, a bit different. So hopefully you will be pleased with this, Nick. Uh, it's, it's not a kiss of life, Phil. No, it's not the kiss of life. No, no, not the kiss of life. You'll be pleased to know, even though. Uh, anyway, so hopefully, oh, 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 you better, you better have a look.